Thank you so much, Alyssa. It's it's such a pleasure to be here. So good to see you all and, and being here in person. I'm really looking forward to the the discussion. We will make it very interactive. We have plenty of time. Uh, lots of you know great deep issues to to talk about. Um, but but Alyssa also asked me to talk a little bit about uh, my background before we get into the presentation itself. Um, as she said, I got my master's PhD from Stanford. Um, I entered into the mechanical engineering program as a master's student, knowing that I'll be, you know, moving on to a PhD uh, degree. Um, then, towards the end, I, I, you know, kept making good progress. Uh, just the place it is, you know, this was uh, early 2000s, so I st started 2002 as a master's student. Summer of 2003, I was, you know, doing two exploratory research projects. One of those was uh, with Steve Chu, who was 97 Nobel laureate, looking at um, bio uh, tagging and how RNAs are, are formed or, you know, how they misfire in protein synthesis. I was also doing some research uh, in, in fuel cells, which is, you know, some of you all in transportation studies uh, might know very, very, very well. And Davis does a lot of great work in that area. And that's the project I ended up actually doing my PhD on fuel cells. So my PhD is looking at yeah, in um, electrochemical reactions on the surface of platinum. And so I did uh, quantum Monte Carlo simulations to see the dynamics of those reactions. Um, and so by the time, this was so in five years, so by 2007, I was reasonably confident that I'm on my way to getting a degree. Okay, it takes some time. Uh, and <laughs> along the way, you get overconfident. And one of those was at three years, you know, after three years, I went to my advisor, said, um, hey, I am, I think, you know, I am ready to graduate. He said, very good, sit down. What's the big problem you have solved? Uh, and I <laughs> left his office. Said, okay, you really need to solve it. He said, uh, to get a PhD degree here in top institutions in the U.S. or, you know, anywhere in the world, you need to, whenever we have a big problem, we give it to a PhD student. Um, and that was, you know, both disappointing but very highly motivating. So I went back, worked for two more years, and, and you know, did something interesting. So the connection back to how my my paths changed and how I accum accumulated different experiences is by 2007, I could see that I have landed on something very interesting, and that you know, I'll, I'll, it was just a matter of writing it up. I said, okay, I am going to graduate in six to nine months, a year. Um, let me just sample Stanford a little bit more. And so I ended up taking a course. I looked at you know, what courses I can take, take uh, in econ or policy. One of those courses I actually ended up taking was called Political Economy of Energy in India. So this was, again, you know, mid, mid to late 2000s. Climate change discussion was just coming up and you know, energy, energy infrastructure. You know, people were starting to kind of, especially in academia, take a step back and look at the bigger system. Uh, a lot of, lots of great work that was happening before that looking at individual oil and gas markets and electricity restructuring. I mean, 90s were, was all about that. 2000s was the first time when people were really saying, okay, there were even bigger questions beyond these markets. So I said, okay, good time. Let me just explore. So I took that course. It was a very small course of 10 students and six teaching staff. Uh, uh, I was the only PhD student. It was a quarter, you know, Stanford sort of quarter system. We all went to India at the end of that quarter for two weeks. It was very transformative, and I, I, I'm from India. I grew up there, so that was not not the big deal. But the the two weeks we spent going to energy infrastructure, large LNG projects, large power plants, right? You know, communities uh, on islands, meeting with you know chief ministers and regulators. That was very transformative for somebody who spent the last five years looking at how <laughs> atoms and molecules <laughs> react on the surface of you know a catalyst and that too. Uh, uh, from a simulation perspective, from a computational perspective, this was the the other side of the world. The big picture was in you know, a very, very fascinating. And I'll cut the story short. So I ended up doing a postdoc in that area, which is very highly unusual. I I get shivers when I think about that moment. So what was I thinking? Is you know so so the advisor, my advisor David Victor, who some of you might might know, was my postdoctoral advisor. Um, he took a leap of faith, saying, "Hey, I'm a mechanical engineer." can do large-scale policy work, and I took a uh, leap of faith, uh, not knowing really what I was getting into, saying, hey, this is very interesting, I just want to do this. Um, I spent two years, uh, some of you know, my most enjoyable and productive years, worked on carbon capture and storage 
policy and business models, worked on uh, global climate change policy, in particular looking at developing countries and how to work with countries like China and India, and worked on national oil companies and was part of a very large uh, book project. Um, and I wrote two, two chapters on the Indian National Oil Company and the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. And the whole idea was that oil remains so important and so big to understand changes elsewhere, you need to understand the, the you know, market that undergirds a lot of what's happening. Um, and then I was hired at UT uh, and UT had this cluster hire going on. Uh, again, it was very, I, I could go my mechanical engineering route or this policy route and UT was hiring somebody uh, in policy who had science engineering background, almost like a thing written for me, not very common then though. It was really, and I would say, uh, very prospective, provident of UT to be thinking. Now there are more positions like that. This is, I'm talking 15 years ago. Um, uh, it was not that common. So I landed the job. I was hired for my carbon capture and storage work. And when I landed there after that, I started a group, which I continued to do some of the work I did before. But as you, as you all know, we also kind of moved beyond and grew out of you know what we did as in our doctorate studies and with our advisors. And uh, most of my work the last 12 years or so has have been on distributed energy systems, looking at solar storage, electric vehicles, more from the demand and the customer side of things. So, so I have this you know, very micro basis, a super global macro basis, and then the last 12 years were kind of somewhere in between, right? And, and I've wrapped up you know, several large projects in that area, and now I'm coming back and revisiting the bigger, bigger parts of the system, how they all connect with each other. Yeah, I'm happy to you know, answer any questions now on this or you know, at the end of this discussion, but I just wanted to kind of share, you know, as Elisa said, some um, of my experiences and, and really just the excitement of following things that were interesting and not thinking back again. I mean, I, many students come to me now, hey, how did you do that? And you know, should we do that? To be honest, uh, more often than not, I, I say, I don't say no, but I do say, hey, be more thoughtful <laughs> than careful than I was, <laughs> right? So I also you know, got lucky along the way and you, you need that too when you take risks. You also need some some bit of luck, and I was I was lucky. Any any questions on this? Okay, you all are you know not very interesting. Let's move on to more interesting <laughs> more interesting things. Okay, let's do that. So, uh, I want to talk to you all about what happened uh, during the winter storm Yuri in February 21, 2021, uh, but also what has happened since then, right? So we'll we'll see a little bit of what happened and you know the impact, but then also really what types of experiences and questions um, uh, it has really generated and you know what can we learn from, from all of that. You know, when I uh, started preparing for this and started uh, going to the airport yesterday, my wife was, my wife asked, so what are you gonna talk on? I said on, on URI and URI's impact. So you are still working on that? Uh, and you know that made me think okay, yeah, it's been, it's been, what, two and a half years, uh, and I've written a few things, I've, you know, given, I don't know, many, many uh, talks on this, been part of many meetings. Uh, uh, yes, it's a valid question. Why am I still working uh, on it? So I'll, I'll come to that. I just want to, before I do that, I want to highlight the Electricity Journal. Many of you might be familiar, familiar with it. I'm the uh, editor-in-chief of this journal. It is uh, the venue that publishes a lot of, you know, uh, issues that you all work on. So if you don't know, Please take a look. Uh, it has lots of very, very good, good papers, and it's very unusual in the way that uh, many big ideas, which are like you know super relevant and hot, that really thoughtful, experienced people like you know regulators and sometimes policymakers, uh, big business people who are also you know happen to be scholar or have you know that scholarly bent, are able to write papers and you know uh, at a venue like this and still you know uh, be out there. Uh, so it's, it's very unusual from that, but it largely still, you know, publishes scholarly papers. So check it out. We will have the details we don't know, but, you know, next year we'll have uh, a special issue focusing on not Texas, but related issues, extreme weather and electricity and transportation systems. So uh, watch it. I'll share that information with you. Please do circulate. Okay. So now back to uh, why, why URI still uh, continues to be important. And you just, you know, give you a flash of, the scale of this event, basically. So this was during the week of 
Valentine's Day from 14th of February to 19th of February um, and counting, you know, over 245 deaths. The largest power outage, 2003 in the New England area, led to nine or 10 deaths, okay? This is 250. More, and there are estimates that put this number at 700 deaths, all right? And, you know, so it's very painful to see on the right, you know, people, this is like physical, right? Just look at the very extreme cold exposure, 161 people. So, you know, I mean, you, you get the idea. It just, you know, got really, really bad, you know, from the human perspective, uh, really awful. Uh, then you have the economic damage estimates. Again, these are, I would say these are conservative estimates. They don't account for, you know, many of the things, but, you know, the estimates range anywhere from, 80 billion all the way up to, you know, 200 plus billion. Um, some of the largest damages we have had in the last 20 years in this country were from Hurricane Katrina and Harvey, and those are like 150 to 200 billion. So this compares like right there in the, in the, in the scale of that damage. Uh, but more relevant to our conversation, which is kind of a little bit narrower, we're not going to look at, you know, all the social and broader impacts, but we are going to focus on the electricity system. And there, um, utility losses have been you know, very significant, $11 billion and counting, uh, right? But it's not just the money. It is the disruption it, it does to the system. So we'll, we'll, we'll go into that. Uh, and also there have been many bankruptcies and also counting. So, you know, this basically completely upset the entire market structure uh, in many ways, in very fundamental ways. And you can see these are all... Uh, retail electricity providers and how many of them have just, you know, gone, gone bankrupt or, you know, have had to sell, sell themselves, right? You know, many large ones. And so that, that has market structure implications in terms of competitiveness and, and so on. So, so my point here was this is very important, but then, you know, I could sleep yesterday night knowing uh, that I had answered to my wife's question, which is, yeah, you know, I'm not just doing because, you know, I've, I've written and published and it's been interesting, but it happens to be a very, very, you know, uh, important piece of what happened and what we can learn uh, in Texas, but also in elsewhere from what happened. Uh, very early on, so this event happened in February as part of, you know, two, uh, I'd say important, not, not in the sense of, uh, you know, important period, important in the sense of the timing of these. Uh, it's very hard. We were all part of this and... You know, at the same time, you had to think about it from, well, how do you manage these better? Or what are we learning? And keep informing the policymaking situation, which moves. The legislative, the legislature was in session as it happened. And the discussion just completely steered very, very fast just towards this. This became the focus of that session. And we all had to be on our toes trying to inform. Otherwise, it just takes a shape. And not, not to say that, you know, real-time informing uh, policymaking is, is, is easy. But yet, you know, we have that responsibility when something is happening. So we, we wrote up these two very important pieces. The first one, the, that paper, the Cascading Risk paper, basically put together the basic facts um, in a short form. And the second paper is a much larger report that really goes into completely data-driven, try to stay away from you know, pointing fingers as to who caught, but it, it just provides the ba data basis for this is what happened. Uh, and, you know, these two reports have, you know, really formed the basis of a lot of uh, the, you know, other discussions that have happened. The other thing that, that I did, uh, which was related, was, you know, this caught federal attention also, right? So within a few weeks of the event, there was a, a, a hearing of the House Space Science and uh, Technology subcommittee but of the entire committee and this this committee had uh, over 100 uh, members in there and uh so you know all the five papers and the pre the three-hour presentation it's all uh, up here so that you know that that will give you closer to the event look as to what was happening this is just all within the few weeks of it and we were trying to make sense of you know uh what we can learn from there okay, so that's kind of a little bit of the picture easy easy Probably a world record from events to academic. <laughs> it could be, it could be, and it, it it could be. I mean, you know, I have I have known colleagues who have written great papers just you know uh, overnight. To me, not not kidding. I I know one or two people who do that, but that's a that's a good lesson. And then I thank you know uh, Josh, who is a colleague at the LVJ School, for taking the leadership. Some of us, like you know Michael Weber and myself and others, were 
kind of day in and day out talking to reporters and policymakers and so on. And we just, you know, we're like, you know, here is what it is. And then somebody else who was not as engaged as us is like, you know, you guys are saying really, really good things and important things and others might be interested in hearing. Let's just put this together in a paper. And so, you know, he took the lead in kind of collating <laughs> all that we were saying and, you know, he was saying and, and others. So, but that's a good lesson, right? You know, something that, that I would like to do more of and it's a good thing for uh, many of you who are students to think about is whenever something big happens, right? That's, that's, there, there is knowledge uh, in the long term, but also, you know, how can you engage with that? So, you know, keep your eyes on what is that big thing? If it happens, you're already knowledgeable, interested, capable in engaging with that system and, you know, teasing out lessons. That can be very successful. This paper has been cited, you know, over 300 times, you know, just in couple, couple. Again, not, not to boast about, but it goes back to your point. It's, you know, these can be very, very momentous. Uh, the other thing is we all know, right? The experiences in the moment can be very important, right? This is documenting what was, what was happening in the moment. And then, you know, you move out months and years out, you can always track the longer trajectory, but you, you kind of forget and you lose track of, you know, uh, that moment. So, yeah, so th these, these two, uh, Basically, you're kind of the, the fodder. So now getting into the system itself, the event itself, uh, what has emerged in terms of, you know, lessons and some still, you know, big questions that, that remain. Uh, I'm not assuming that all of you are familiar with, you know, uh, the Orcut markets. I'll just take a brief moment to uh, give you that. So we have three large interconnections. Uh, these are, you know, synchronized AC systems. So this is the Western Interconnect, which is California part of. This is the Eastern Interconnect. And then ERCOT which is 70% of uh, Texas, the 90% of Texas's load. So not all of Texas is in ERCOT. Some of it is in SPP, the South Power Pool. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's not uh, AC synchronized. It's not uh, connected through AC ties. It has DC ties to both you know, uh, the North, but also to Mexico. Uh, but that's the reason why you know, it's Texas is a system of its own. It, it doesn't have a, an AC connection. Um, in terms of what the supplies are. So this is a generating capacity. So roughly 130 gigawatts. Uh, that's, the, that's the largest uh, generation generating capacity uh, in the U.S. by almost like twice. I think, you know, Florida is probably next, uh, around 60, 70. Um, or so half of that, roughly half of that, um, and this number has been changing very fast, right? Uh, two or three years ago, it was, you know, more like 45% and now because wind and solar are growing very fast. So wind is very substantial. It's, again, by far the largest uh, wind install capacity uh, of any state. Um, and then you have some coal, you have some nuclear, and solar has been growing very fast as well. And solar has almost, you know, wind growth in Texas is almost flat now, right? It's really solar. And as you'll see later, storage that is really taking off. In terms of energy usage, you know, you still most of that is natural gas, a lot of wind, some coal, nuclear, and, and you know, solar and others play into this. Uh, you, these are some interesting numbers here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you see there's three and a half gigawatts of storage already. This is utility scale. This is, this is very big and almost as, as much as there is in California today. And I'll show you a chart how fast that number is growing, but why, right? Why, why that is happening? happening so and you know there's a lot of wind penetration was almost 70 percent highest penetration and solar penetration was 32 percent these are again moments in time not a peak demand per se but when these resources were giving the most to the system right so these these are very large uh numbers you know we are not in the one two five ten percent zone anymore uh for both wind and solar and and that also plays into uh the opportunities as well as challenges and complexities for the system. Again, something that we'll, we'll see a, a little bit later. Okay. This is, you know, it's, it's it mostly what's been growing is there's a lot of slow solar growth in just the last few years, right? And this shows you the peak load and you are not able to appreciate the scale here because they all look the same, but even a little bit movement which surprises you has a huge impact, and I'll show you that. And that is exactly the discussion right now in Texas, you know, two and a half years um, after UE. But, you know, natural gas, it's flat, right? Texas uh, regulators, 
policymakers would like to see more natural gas because of the resilience reliability issue. But you know, you will see there are many different things that are being tried, and you know, it's being hard to bring more natural gas uh, online for a, for a variety of reasons. Um, and then really, you're seeing the the one color that obviously changes is you know storage, and you're seeing solar to to continue. So this is just to lay the basic land, just so that you know you have some idea of what the system is and what some of the you know big moving pieces are. We'll 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 get into some of the the deeper questions uh, just just in a moment. Okay, so now now the event itself. I, mean, I won't spend too much time, but I do want to tell you what happened and focus most of the time uh, in terms of what has been done after that. So uh, this is what the storm looked like from above. This is Florida. This is Texas. It, it just you know was massive, very 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 big. Um, as uh, you can see that the temperatures were very low. So negative, obviously, is, you know, it, it's, uh, and this is degree centigrade. And so it stayed there for, you know, many days, right? 132 hours there. And, and the red here is how much capacity deficit in terms of generation was. So that, you know, this was like, again, the same thing. The very tough weather conditions were slightly causing mm -hmm. the, the constraints in the electricity market. And, you know, this is what it looked like in terms of electricity outages, um, across the south uh, here. And over time, you see, it started um, 14th, 15th of February, and then, you know, the consecutive, the same day, you see it just completely uh, cascaded. Entire. At, at one point, uh, there was 20 gigawatts of load that was not being sh served in, in Texas. So roughly 5 million customers, not people, 5 million customers. And each, for example, of one customer is a family. So, you know, you can imagine... Um, millions of people being being affected uh, by this. We lost power at our house for seven days. Seven days, uh, and we did not know. Should we? We didn't even expect that there was <laughs> anything like this. So part of this, and I'm not going to dwell too much on it. As part of this was also communications. At that point in time, and things have changed now. Uh, we had no idea. Uh, nobody from the system. Right? I mean, of course, you read news and you know you make your own conclusions and assessments, but. Uh, so there was very little awareness in the system uh, regarding what, what was going to happen. And then after those seven days, we lost water for five days after. So these are decoupled, okay? Good or bad, uh, you know, they were both good, you know. Not having electricity and power at the same time would probably have been, you know, much, much worse. But, but anyway, and, and others, as you saw, had a much worse turn of fate uh, compared, to, compared to us. Um, so, so you know, this this was pretty massive and happened, you know, very very quickly, just within a matter of half a day, the night of the fifteenth. This all just you know really went out of control, and this is what was happening underneath. You know, so why? What happened? Right. So, what you're seeing here is so the top black line is the demand, which is called the load here, right, and this is the gray line is the projection, right, but that was not all of what that was able to be met. So that, that's what the load shedding part is. The idea was that these will be controlled or rolling blackouts like, you know, you know what happened uh, in California. Uh, but these were, <laughs> they didn't turn out to be rolling. You know, like, you know, you lost it. You, we have no idea when you're going to get it back. So system basically lost control. And what was happening is, you know, early on, some wind started to go, you know, wind turbines and equipment froze. And so, you know, wind was not supplying a lot to begin with, but, you know, some of it went offline, and then after that, the night of 14th, 15th, around the midnight, a lot of gas generation, and you know, some coal, but you know, mostly gas generation just started to go offline in a way that the system didn't anticipate. So when you have this imbalance of load really going in its own direction and supply in the other direction, that's like nightmare, right, for system operators. And, you know, if I show you this, this is what it means from the system operation perspective. So this is a plot of frequency, but the time here is, this is, this is dates, right? Days. The time here is 1.23 a.m. on February 15th, okay? So this is 10 minute increments. So we are talking about 40 minutes. Uh, the frequency, is, which is supposed to be 60 hertz, went down and was, you know, 59.302 and the idea is that, you know, if you're in that zone, below 59.4 for more than nine minutes, systems 
plants just start automatically tripping. At that point, the system operator doesn't have any more control. So a lot of these will automatically trip and then you might end up in a situation where the whole grid is gone and then you have to do a black star, okay? Which is, you know, Texas has no idea, to be honest, how, you know, black star partly had to be done in the 2003 blackouts in, in New England. And, and so that was kind of the idea. When, when the system reached this point, even before that, they started to load shed. But after that, they added a lot more load shed, you know, just because they didn't want to be in that, you know, they wanted to balance and keep the frequency right. So they were actively load shedding just so that they could keep as much sync between supply and demand as possible. Okay, so, so you know, one thing set in motion, it was, you know, for system operators, it was less about can we supply the load, it was more about can we keep the system from going to a complete blackout, right, uh, for a full uh, black step, yes. Regarding the thermal outages, I know a lot of gas, yeah. Very good question. I'm I'm getting there. Yes, yeah, very good question. Right? The question is why why were these plans going offline? So we'll get there in a second. Okay, so increasing demand, you know, supply falling off charts because of, you know, uh, frozen equipment largely and, you know, difficulty in fuel supply and then operators just caught in the moment, right? I mean, if you anticipate this and the South Power Pool, which is in, in the, it supplies uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, which is part of the same weather system, which lies in SPP, also has, you know, parts of Texas, they fared much better, right? They only had three hours uh, from load, load shed for about, you know, five gigawatts or so. We had from load shed of 20 gigawatts that lasted, you know, for, for hours and, and, you know, couple days. Uh, so SPP did very well because they're interconnected. So we'll we'll get there in a second, uh, but it was it was you know multiple different things all all coming together that that led to this uh, difficulty. Okay, so this this gets to uh, the point as to what what really were the causes of this, and this really should help us set up a couple other things I'll I'll highlight later on in terms of you know what the discussion is like now in terms of you know people are people's assessment, and when I say people, analysts and scholars, uh, assessment of how far the system has come and how, how much improvement and progress has there been in the last two and a half years since the event to prevent something catastrophic like this ha from happening again, okay? And, you know, there are different assessments, but there are one or two things where, where my own thinking is a little, little bit different from, you know, what, what kind of the mainstream analytical uh, thinking is, and I'll tell you why. But, but the... The one way to look look at the different causes of failure, there are basically you can cut the different causes in five different dimensions, and all of them I can assure you, all of them were at play. So it's not to say, you know, only this was happening, only wind was going offline, and you know, but demand was not helping. No, it's everything basically all came together, and that's that paper, that cascading risk paper, basically says, hey, you know, everything basically uh, uh, aligned to create a very cascading. Uh, nature of failure, but the first one uh, goes back to the earlier question: is on equipment failure. So these are, you know, sensors and pressure lines and you know, equipment at the power plants, right? That basically either froze over or got clogged or you know, stopped functioning uh, because of low temperature. Okay, um, and that that was a very big part of what happened in Texas. Right, you know the the thermal power plants going offline. Uh, it was the equipment failure of multiple different kinds. There was not one kind, and these are in a large. You know, many of you probably have seen uh, thermal power plants. Uh, you know, lots of lots of machinery uh, and many different ways. The, you know, these can can fail. So that was that was a large uh, chunk. There was a lot of you know organizational aspects uh, leading. When I said you know. When at our place in Austin, we lost power, we had no idea. Well, you know, regulators didn't have a whole better idea either, right? There are meetings that happened just a couple of days before that. And I'll show you, show you some charts of how that is even reflected in some of the system assessment and modeling right, right, you know, a day or a couple of days before. Um, they really, you know, they, they knew. I mean, they're, they're obviously more ahead than the, you know, broader public. Um, they knew that you know things were gonna be tight, but but they had no idea that you know 
it was going to be this bad. And and part of this was, you know, how things are modeled, how things are understood, how things are coordinated. And when you have a set of processes that have been going on for 10, 15 years, um, you can start to take comfort. You know, if you feel like, okay, on paper, these models and these processes um, are giving you a comfortable margin of, you know, 10% or so, like, you know, that has worked for us before and that will work for us after the, the difficulty is when the underlying circumstances are changing as they are changing, you know, certainly in the Texas system, you know, also in the California system, but, you know, generally everywhere, unless that process has been stress tested, which is, you know, what you really did, stress tested the whole process. And then you're like, you have many of these oops moments. It's like, okay, that is, that is so obvious looking back. Uh, we made a mistake and let's just go ahead and fix that, right? So there are many of these, you know, operational aspects of how the regulator was coordinating, how the regulator was even, you know, taking in information about weather and climate and thinking, you know, very deeply about what the modeling was telling and were there any issues or not. And and on the, on the side of the power plants for that matter, right, uh, things had not been stress tested. The last event, something that even came, you know, not even half close to this was in 2011, when there were, you know, uh, brownouts for like four hours or so, also in February. And, you know, most most people were not affected, most plants were not affected. Um, and, you know, things really didn't change a whole lot after that. There were recommendations that were made by the Federal uh, Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, uh, in 2011, but the and the Texas legislature considered it, but you know, never really acted on it. Said, okay, uh, good and important and helpful lessons, but you know, we don't really need to do anything. So, a lot of you know, none of this was really built in or tested for uh, many years, even at the power plants. I'll show you a chart just in a minute, just to uh, give you a sense of you know how this surprised even the power plant operators, just because hey, you feel like. You have design. You you start taking comfort in your models, and it's a bit. This is you know operations in rare uh, events in extreme conditions. Uh, your your paper models will only go go so far, especially, right? If they're old and they have not been tested, right? So I mean this this was kind of the very uh, a big lesson that happened. Uh, I'll I'll show you a little bit later on. You know in terms of how renewable and distributed generation were playing or not playing in this event. Uh, I have a little more to say. Interconnection, I already gave you a sense that text, or, or card is not interconnected. SPP is. SPP was able to import in Oklahoma power from elsewhere, so it was helpful. So part of the question was, hey, the whole system was facing, was stressed, and so even if you were in, interconnected, could we have uh, imported? And the answer is, yeah. You know, SPP did import, and it did help them. Uh, right? So, you know, sure. And, and URI is not the only type of event, rare event, that will happen. In general, interconnection can help you export Texas. I mean, a big strength of the Texas electricity market is that, you know, it produces a lot of electricity and relatively cheaply, right? You know, this is wholesale prices. And so most of the time you can be exporting lots of, you know, good reasons, but but especially from an extreme event perspective, uh, yes, you know, in, um, you Texas could have benefited, but, but, you know, that's the other discussion. But nothing really has moved in terms of that's a much bigger nut, right, for, for Texas to move forward and interconnection is like, you know, just a whole different paradigm. Uh, okay, and then the last one, and you know, I, this is this is where I want to make make a point, which I think is a departure from, you know, most of the current um, analytical, scholarly, critical thinking in this this area. And th that has emerged for me more recently. Even I was in that that camp. And not not to say that, you know, it's it's a radical departure for for any reason, but but part of what happened is uh, you know this is no surprise for people, you know, who work in this area day in and day out, that the gas and electricity system are coupled, right? Especially in Texas. I showed you over 40% of generation capacity or 40% of actual uh, energy is generated in Texas by gas, right? And a lot of these gas facilities, production to processing, right, to, you know, sending these to power plants, these all use all sorts of equipment that are powered by electricity. So there is this coupling. If you don't have, if you lose power, you're not able to generate gas that you can send to the power plants. You know, this is a cyclical thing, and and that played out in very very gory ways. That was also part of the big oops moment. It's like, 
there are many gas facilities that were uh, signed up as you know demand response or you know uh, loads that would be responsive, and they were and they were not registered as critical loads because they were critical to the electricity supply system, and so they lost power. And once you lose that power at the gas processing facility, you're producing less gas. You're basically compounding the situation. And you know th this was one of those like you know how come this ever happened? But you know one of the points keep in mind because this will come back when I tell you why I think you know the what we're seeing in terms of policy making in Texas. And even though at at one level it tells you like I can't believe even after you know Yuri we were not able to make progress on that. But when you peel the layers off, maybe it is not that big of an issue. Uh, it is not again. All of these are very very important. All of these are very very big. But where would you really like to see the movement? And you know, we have not seen a lot of movement in terms of policies that really tighten the gas supply, right? Um, and and maybe you know uh, that is not as bad. It is it is not good, but maybe it is not that as bad. So, well, but that happened as well. Okay, so roughly I would say about quarter of power plants said that they couldn't generate or they had to generate less because they didn't get enough fuel or because the fuel gas, uh, the pressure was low or, you know, fuel supply related issues, a quarter, a quarter of them, right? But still remember three quarters, it was not about the fuel supply, it was the equipment or, you know, some other thing that was personnel uh, and so on. Pricing, right? Prices were so high for gas and I'll, that's, that's, I'll come to that, that, you know, if you are a generator, you're like, you know, I'm, I'll not produce. Right, and I'm gonna lose money, right? And some of them they have an obligation to serve, right? Uh, so, but but at the margin, you're like, you know, this it doesn't make sense for me to be producing. Many many generators lost hundreds of millions of dollars, including one that lost a billion dollars, producing this. So they had fuel, they were generating, they lost, right? Because you are able to sell. Electricity prices are capped and very you know reasonably high. You know, nine thousand dollars per megawatt hour back then. It's down to five thousand. So they were capped, but the gas prices were so high that they were losing money. I'll, I'll show you some of that details. But just keep in mind, the point I'm trying to make is uh, there are many things that are happening within the power generation system, right, at the power plants, right, equipment-wise or finance-wise, supply chain related. And of course, you have this connection to the gas system. Both of them combined together, uh, but but they have different solutions, right? And so we'll we'll see that in more details in a bit. So this is uh, now what I'm going to do is I'll show you some interesting data that gets into some of the operational aspects of you know what was happening um, and you know where could the fixes be. So when I said uh, there are lots of you know oops moment in some terms of operations at the power plants, what you're seeing here is uh, in, these are all reported outages and, and they're, uh, this is the rating of the generator which is a, a power plant said they can operate perfectly fine at you know the outputs that they offer to the system at that level, right? So let's say they say, hey, you know, 10 degree Fahrenheit, okay? But what you're seeing, what happened is they all, and so, and the y-axis here is uh, the temperature at the outage. When, you know, so all this data was captured, at what temperature did the plants you know, just basically went out? Because we know the timing when they went out and we know the temperature at that point, so you can do that. And what you're seeing is, so anytime you're above this, meaning that that power plant went out uh, above its rated temperature. So it's, it's set on paper 10 degrees, but actually it was out by the time the temperatures were 15 degrees or 18 degrees even, right? You see, you know, some of this is like pretty, uh, uh, you know, a huge, huge difference, okay? And so that that has to be, is like, you know, you, again, this is, you have big machinery and you have done this modeling, you have designed the system, it's you've really not been tested, right? And, you know, it's not been maintained that way, it's not been tested that way, it's obviously a lot of this has been not been, winterized for, you know, lengthier periods of time. And so, you know, that kind of reflects in items. So, you, know, you have to understand why Why is this, right? Did, did people try to cheat? The answer is, you know, no. I mean, that that's maybe one, one you know, but they did 
you know, they, they told all paper, it some seems to work out, but it's really that, you know, you, you have to be at it. You have to revisit. And there is no reason up until Yuri to revisit this, reconsider this. And at that moment in time, people are like, okay, you know, maybe what we think we designed it for, um, either it doesn't work, number one, or it needs some more continual engagement and maintenance to be that. But my, see, my main point is, this is at the plant level. This is not to do with, you know, anything else that is happening. This is like what's happening, okay? This is important because this is one of those areas where things have actually moved uh, really strongly uh, in terms of, you know, policy changes. Uh, this was the other you know, thing. I mentioned to you how just even a couple of days before, even the regulators were, you know, not, not very concerned. They're like, yeah, you know, system is going to, the weather is going to be tight, but, you know, we have plenty of reserves. Uh, part of the big surprise, and that continues to surprise ERCOT, uh, including you know this past summer, which I mean we're are we out in from summer in Texas? I don't know, um, but it's it's demand, right? Uh, you know they again. So this is again you know many of you do modeling, is like you use past data to extrapolate, and is that a good representation? I mean we, we all you know here I think past data is not a you know good uh, metric to understand. Uh, future, but it, it turns out to be, you know, <laughs> it has a lot of meaning when you, depending on what you're using it for and how the underlying system itself might be changing. So what you're seeing here is, so these are for each curve. So let's, let's pick the top curve, which is on the, you know, this is error, how much error in terms of gigawatts of power, right? So this is tens of thousands of megawatt was being made when the forecast was done on a certain day. So the event started night of 14, 15, and this forecast for load was being made on like three days ago, February 11th. See? Seven, seven gigawatt, 10 gigawatt. They were short 10 gigawatts. Yes, exactly. A error could be either way, totally. So this was like, they were underestimating demand by seven gigawatts on a tight, system, that's the margin you have. I mean, you basically blew away all your margin, not because anything happened on supply, just because you underestimated what was going to happen on, on demand. So the question is, why? Why did they underestimate demand by so much? I'll come to that in a second. But but see, you know, regulators and system operators have models and processes and so on, and, you know, they run it through and they have to base their decisions on on rules and process, and this all checks out. Everything basically checked out. Uh, and this is what we learned, that you know, the demand that actually manifested during the system was, was much, much larger. Yes, please. In general, it's ERCOT, summer PP. Very good question. Very relevant question, actually. That is also part of you know, what challenges all of this. It is a summer peaking system. So it is designed, ERCOT's entire focus throughout has been, let's operate in summer we can see. I told you, right? Our peak gener our, our install capacity is 130 gigawatts. Now, when URI happened, it was more like you know 105 gigawatts, 105.10. And if you have a projected peak demand of 65 gigawatts, 67 gigawatts, it seems like you know with all the planned outages and everything, you still have a lot of legroom. Which is even the worst case, there is a lot of legroom. So most of the thinking is entirely focused on the summer. It turns out that now, you know, more of, you're seeing more of this in terms of winter stress, and you have to design your systems for events like this in winter and for in, for in summer. And you'll see, you know, why so, and the nature of the demand itself and nature of the capacity, both basically play into why we are seeing, you know, in, in addition to climate, Right? Why we are seeing this type of peaky behavior? Yes. All up on that regarding winter peaking um, is Texas and got seeing a lot of increased immigration of flexed pups. Um, and does that spike your demand? Very, very good. Next, next slide. You are, you are, you are, you know, really like a slide ahead. Uh, coming up. Yes, please. Additional twenty thousand or so megawatts and foot on sense really. It's that additional capacity designed around serving winter needs or summer needs because like a stable climate pretty much the same but yeah. I mean, you're getting massive like differences right your ability to gas plant it's operating 
parameters, right? More, are maybe more suitable for it. They will do it in summer, but it's yeah. really built for the winter emergencies, right? So yeah. that additional 20 down, I guess the whole of the 130, well, I just switched gears there, but you know, yeah. of the 130, what portion of it is really designed around summer and what Corey is really designed around what? Very, very excellent question. Most of it is designed for summer, okay? After Yuri, of course, the focus has not, not I, I shouldn't say the focus has shifted. Summer is so bad and tough in Texas. There is no shifting focus away from summer, right? Uh, but looking back, it was all about summer. Now it is also about winter. Uh, the thing is, you know, what, what's ERCOT, and we'll talk about that in a second. You know, it's an energy-only market. What then, you know, so some of you are familiar and others may not be, and I'll, I'll tell you what the difference is. But it means that the prices, you know, when the tradings are happening, those prices are also supposed to incentivize future generation. Okay, so we'll see that connection. And, you know, so it's called scarcity pricing. Much of that is expected in summer. Even with, you know, how much ever bad it gets in winter, if you are a generator and if you're planning, it's like, okay, I'll get, you know, bad pricing in winter once, twice for a day. In summer, I will see it 20 times. What are you going to do? Focus on winter. Uh, sorry, focus on summer. Focus on summer. So a really good question, right? And this is where, this is where what a generator is thinking and the collection of all generators thinking independently leads to an outcome which is inconsistent with what the society wants. And so there is there's a market failure in here, which is, it, it, so we'll talk about that. Yes, please. So oh, ERCOT is an energy market, right? PGM's capacity, California. Somewhere in between. <laughs> we like to make out any deal that, yeah. Um, do you think that the structure of ERCOT as an energy aligned market can contribute it or may, may contribute in the future to um, more more issues that are around like type super tight supply for or perhaps building generation that is really only suited and aimed at certain market conditions with because they don't want to do it all those that are not going to make them apply and therefore you're going to see like problems here you see continued problems and and should there be a change in the market structure in california we call it resource apps now we can say that's a good thing or a bad thing that is, but like, should there be a requirement and then therefore a price floor, right? For generators to assert this, say, right? You're, 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 maybe you're capped at some point, but you're always guaranteed at, at a certain price, right? Now, I know that kind of goes contrary to ERCOT's model, right? Which is fine, but like, did I wonder if the retailer concept and then also the pair, right? Yeah. There, is, there really are no, like, structural guardrails, right, that would, to me, at least, simply prevent this future if it's market-driven in the market. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so that's kind of the heart of the question, and I have, I have a number of slides to get into that. Uh, you, it's not lost on the system operators or the regulators, right, which is we... It's, it's not just about any, it's not anymore about, you know, everybody build what you build. It is the focus right now is we don't want other year or other blackout. You know, it's, it's not a, that, you know, we'll not get into emergency situations or we'll not have some, some blackouts. I don't think really, you know, even though they're not saying, they're not saying, nobody's saying, hey, it's okay if we have some blackouts or you know, minor blackouts. Even though I, I think, you know, worst of the worst, that's okay. What they don't want, and when I say they, I mean the politicians and the regulators, they don't want, I'll show you why I think that, is another UV. It's just, you know, economically damaging, but also politically, you know, very, very can be damaging. Um, and so the focus right now is exactly on, well, how can you? No, it's not just about, you know, build anything and, you know, sort of just focus on prices, but how can you direct more or incentivize more investments and operable or dispatchable generation in those times is very hard. Um, so there's a lot of focus there. You can you can 
do it in a couple different ways or in a hybrid way, and you described some, you know, either capacity or you know, in energy through scarcity pricing. The system, Orca system, is very challenged. What it is not doing, right? And and there are good reasons why you know there is there is been a good experience with that in the Texas market, and there is reasonable belief that uh, with some tweaks and even some big changes you can preserve the larger structure of energy only market and still be able to incentivize more so so i'll i'll come back to this but this is kind of this is where i would say most of orcots the regulators the the system operators thinking and then in regula- its interaction with the regulator so these are two different bodies the utility commission and and the iso obviously um is is what do you do how do you sort of saying there is a capacity payment which is, you know, capacity, sort of saying capacity, with this fundamental belief and, you know, really good things about the energy-only market, how can you still use that same structure but ensure and what you want here, and that is the big difference in terms of what they're after. I'll show you some things which are, which are surprised. It's happened this week. Uh, just an announcement that came out from ARCAD, which just surprised everybody uh, in terms of, okay, the, uh, nobody expected this. Uh, goes back to this issue, but I, I have more to say on that. Um, so, so going back to demand, so demand surprise, and so the question is, well, what's happening? Why, why is this this much of surprise? And here is some of the answer. This is not the only answer because there are many different types of customers: industrial customers, and you know, commercial and residential. This is only looking at the residential sector. Uh, something else that is big that is happening right now in Texas, also because of low average wholesale prices, not. You know, this peaky peaky, but you know, if you don't care, if you don't need electricity 24 7, you don't care. And in a lot of bit, Bitcoin mining, crypto mining, that's Texas is kind of really awesome for that. You know, you can use negative or zero price wind to just run all of that. So that's a huge part of demand growth. These are the large loads that Texas is seeing. They also contribute during the day demand, right? And then they can turn around and uh, reduce their demand and turns out get paid $40 million for doing that. So there are lots of, you know, moral hazard is happening, but, you know, he, this is what the market is and it basically draws them in. And is it bad? Is it bad that they're able to use really low-cost electricity? Well, that's what storage is for. And these guys are able to do that. So that's kind of, a, you know, storage. But it has, you know, other effects on the on the broader system. So it just, this 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 volatility of very low prices and in the peaky prices, and then who really tries to use uh, matters a lot. So this is this is exactly on the question. This is, these are heaters, right? And in this map, you're saying this is a percentage of residential electric heating. And you see Texas South in general, uh, mostly in electric heaters. And, and why? Electric heaters, if they're I mean, not, not the heat pumps, uh, these are, they get very, very inefficient at low temperature. Right? They just you know switch more and they get very inefficient, but that's not a big deal for the South, right? And so, of course, uh, that is what was installed. Here is what it looks like, though. So what you're seeing is you know how cold it gets. That's the you know uh, heating degree days on the x-axis, and then per capita demand that you're seeing in, in uh, it's, this is all Texas data. And you see, obviously, the colder it gets, not that it rises, but it rises non-linearly, okay? So this is basically capturing that effect. You know, if you are up until, of course, if you're in this zone, if you're planning for this zone, you know, maybe it looks linear. But the more and more you start going in the other direction, I mean, you know, deeper into that, it, the more likely you're going to be surprised. So in a part, some of this uh, basically plays into uh, why demand is underpredictable. Right, it's not the only thing, but you know you get the idea. It's actually a very significant part of that. To your you now coming back to your question, moving forward, you will see both because of the Inflation Reduction Act, there are lots of incentives. It was not there for heat pumps before, uh, but now there are you know very significant incentives, just you know comparable to uh, solar and storage. Uh, and you're seeing, well, this is a big problem for us. Uh, uh, we need to fix that. It will help the system, and you know it's not as expensive. Right? So I think you will see more and more. Uh, of heat pump uh, deployment in the Texas market, it helps a lot. Yes, planning for like cold climate, air source heat pumps, and variable speed. If I those technology that would well in winter 
as these technologies are adopted, or is it become something trying to go like single speed, get them out deployed, prefer is uh, so there there you will see a lot of variation, right? That will just depend on you know whether a property is being rented, a property is being you know folks are living in there, and also you know how much they're willing to spend on the margin. Right. Is that going to make the big difference or just the fact that, you know, you're not in that zone and, you know, heat pumps are going to be, you know, a lot more efficient? Is that going to be make, make a difference? I think so. You'll see a lot more variation on what exactly happens. But will this chart change? Will this change? And you know, will it look more heat pumps? Yes, definitely. It will. Yes. <laughs> But uh, when we're talking about forecasting demand, I think that by definition, we're going to fail forecasting outliers because all of the tools we are using, uh, statistical tools, AI tools, are aiming for the most common activities and outliers. They are called outliers because we are, we are failing to predict them again and again. And I think that this is a great, a great example of that other type of tool, probability of failure, and you said the stress test plus forecasting need to be the real tool. Okay. Yeah, no, no, totally. And and so you can do that. You can, you know, try to get at the outliers. And then once you, I mean, the, the thing with machine learning, I teach, I teach uh, machine learning at UT, uh, is, you know, you, you can, you can always hone in a certain zone, but then you'll start making mistakes elsewhere. Your overall error can only go down. You can improve in certain areas by trading off in other areas, right? And maybe in certain cases, that's okay, right? Um, okay, uh, something just, I have, I have a lot more to say, so I want to, you know, move, move a little bit quickly here. But, you know, just keep in mind, just this past summer, from June to September, peak load in Texas increased by 7% compared to 2022. That is mind-blowing. That does not happen. Over the last 20 years, peak demand has increased 1% to 2%. Okay? And so just in one year, you saw growth equal to five years. That, I mean, you know, you, how do you plan for that when you're basically planning for everything you can get? Suddenly, you have, a, you know, three times or five times a harder a job. So this is, this is, you know, this is a much more complicated, bigger system. There's more people moving into Texas more businesses moving into Texas, but also the types of businesses, right? And I, I mentioned crypto mining. You know, yes, right, there's a lot of hydrogen stuff that potentially will come into high, you know, Texas, and they can do the same thing. If you're doing elect electrolysis, you can benefit from low prices, and then, you know, when you can turn around, uh, but, but exactly uh, how this all adds up really creates big challenges. Yes, please. It's compared to 1%, is that 1% per year? Yeah, yes. What 1% per year? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So there there are three main changes that have happened, uh, some of which we already have, have brought up in terms of and when I say main changes this, these are from policy and regulatory perspective, right? Uh one is that now there is a winterization requirement for power plants. All power generators are required to winterize their equipment and certify that to uh, 21 standards recommendations that FERC had offered, right? Uh, so that's that's a big one, and I have a little bit more to uh, say on that. And now, you know, every, the CEOs have to attest it, and there is a pretty steep, a million dollar per day fine if for, for non-compliance. So, you know, that that piece has been done, okay? Uh, keep in mind what, what I was talking about earlier is operational aspects at the, at the plant were a very big part, right? And so this basically kind of addresses that. This is also the belief of regulators and the policymakers saying, okay, if you fix that, big big problem is is gonna be be fixed. And I think, you know, I, I kind of agree with that, right? Uh, for a long time, I was in the camp thinking, no, you have to fix both at the same level. You have to fix the gas system as well as the electricity system. You know, many of us, including I have said before, is ask all the gas you know, the whole system also to be winterized and so on. It turns out uh, it's both much more challenging, could be potentially a lot more expensive and not entirely needed uh, to, to you know, ensure better operations. You can never, you know, be fail safe, but to ensure better operations. Yes, please. 
and not to get too far off, but sign for you at the station is who factually to make sure that that's what's actually going on or anything to say to that. No, so great question. There, there are inspections. So the the uh, ARCOT, ISO basically sends inspectors and there's ins inspection that happens. Yes. Yeah. And many of these, you know, you can file open, not on, they don't put it on online, but it's an open system. You can file open records and get, get. so many reporters actually have been filing these and reporting the age of that. So there's a lot of, you know, information in the system seeing what's happening. Okay. Uh, in terms of pricing, so I, there is a lot. This is, this is where really the focus has been. So this is set. This is one thing done, right? Winterize. All power plants, generators winterize to 21 recommendations. Done. No more action needed. Just follow up and make sure you know, it's, it's happening. Uh, and if you don't do things and you things are discovered after the fact, the penalties are not, not you know, small. Pricing is, this is an ongoing effort. If you have demand surprising you all the time, if you have lots of variability in supply, how do you still use the existing market construct of, of scarcity pricing through energy-only markets to basically still get generation uh, during those hours of need? So I have more to say on that. And then something else I, I alluded to, we had no idea what was happening. There was no communication. There are many things. People were being disconnected. You're, you're facing near-death situations, and then next you know is you have been disconnected by your electric utility. A lot of that happened. A lot of that happened. So those things have been fixed now, right? So these are also those oops moments. It's like, okay, you know, uh, if we, can, we can't. We are not that. And, of course, that's an oversight. That's a mistake. Let's go back. Nobody can disconnect during an emergency up for, for a few days after that. And you, there's a due process of how you even go with that. And if somebody says that they can't pay back, you have to come up with a plan to help them pay back. And all of those things are very good and positive, led to lots of oops and lots of difficulties, but, but things have moved. Those, that's also, I would say, has been solved. Okay? So two things have been almost set and solved, I would say. Um, this is the big work in progress, pricing. Okay, so most of my slides basically focus on number one and number two. So this goes on that winterization thing where, uh, you know, this was done about six months after, right? So it took the regulator six months or so. So this was done in October of 21, where they said, okay, everyone has to winterize, and, and you, you already saw this. Um, and, you know, this, the CEO just, just earlier this week at a conference said, you know, what's the biggest thing that we have done since URI? is to winterize the power system. And I, th I think it is, it is pretty big. It is, it is very significant because a lot of the, most of the issue was at the generators just because, you know, I mean, you, you don't need to focus. Uh, you think it works um, and, you know, you're not organized that way. You're focusing on summer. You're preparing for summer, both so that, you know, you can supply the system but also make money, right? Because if you're not running in summer, you're basically losing all the big money and you, you'll see a chart, right? So, and for all, all these, you know, very human and organizational and the generator lens, I mean, it's not their fault to focus on their money. Just that, you know, this event reminded them, hey, by not focusing that, you're hurting the system and people, but actually you're also leaving your own money on table, right? Um, and so that all is basically encapsulated in, in this saying, okay, we are all better off and you're all better off. Just winterize. Yes, please. And I understand that this will absolutely help. But still, that other diagram you said is fascinating. These plants were rated for... Yeah. Yes. Just saying, okay, we're going to make this, do this, it doesn't necessarily... It, 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 and absolutely right. Just saying it doesn't, there are two other pieces to this. Number one is these, there is, there is certainly more focus on the inspections. Right. And, you know, it's not just about saying, but is it really happening? So that's number one. Second, there's an after the fact penalty as well. So for if, if you failed and if you didn't winterize, well, you not only you lost money by not being able to supply the market, but, you know, you're also going to, you know, get really uh, penalized. Uh, so but, you know, it, just saying that is not going to going to help. Right. So some of this could be as, you know, you have to. uh you know, put on insulation. You have to put on, you know, heating systems. Make sure they're they're work, working. And you know, if they, you don't need it, 
And if you don't need it for 10 years in a row, right, you know, something gives. And it's some, you know, it's, it's, it's not crazy hard. It's not crazy hard, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, so here, I mean, this is, this is an important one, uh, right? Where, where the point I'm trying to, am yes, please. So you take it back on pricing again, so? On pricing, can you just hold on a second and I'll, I'm coming to that. I have, I have a lot more to say on pricing. Yeah, let's, let's come back on that. And so this is, this is very important, right? You know, one of the things is you know, what has Texas done and why are policymakers not doing more? Uh, it's, you know, we are seeing some progress, but the harder issues are being left on table. Uh, you have to wonder, and you know, I, you know, some of you probably, you know, uh, think about the politics and the political science and the political economy of this. Um, and, and I have wondered, okay, is it really that bad? Are policymakers really that inactive and, and unresponsive? But if that is so, how and why can they get away with something like this? And my answer compared to where I was a few months ago and now is a, is a lot more un refined, which is there has been progress, better progress than it actually shows up on paper. And so, you know, my point, the first point is, it is actually very important for policymakers. So this is 2022, last year's gubernatorial elections where Beto was up against uh, Greg Abbott, the current governor and the governor then when Yuri happened. And you see right here, I, you know, I, I, when I was at gym working out, you know, ad on the TV, like minutes long ad would be on the electricity infrastructure, right? And so this this was a very big uh, election uh, issue, okay? So you can see that. And then also you can see, these are all very recent numbers uh, that, you know, no matter which line of the, you know, party line you are on, many people think that the government has not done done a lot, right? And then this is what happened right before the elections last year, right, where this is for Governor Greg Abbott, disapproval ratings were, were, were going up, and this was, you know, largely because of the electricity system, actually. There's, you know, not, not much else where people will start disliking him for, okay? So this was a very, very big issue. So you have to wonder if somehow you are saying, and many people are saying, is that the politicians are not doing much and the leaders are not doing much. You also have to have a very good answer that not doing much, you know, doesn't mean. And the answer there is, it does matter. It does matter uh, a lot, okay? And so one of those big question marks is how? So there has been winterization mandate requirement for the electricity system. Earlier we talked about how the electricity and the gas system are coupled, right? 50%, roughly half of electricity generation in Texas, 40, 50% is from gas. And we saw how the gas system depends on electricity to run, right? To run its compressors and you know pumps and you know everything processing facilities, and it can really uh, create this this bad loop. And yet, not much has happened by regulation from a natural gas perspective, right? So, the calls from analysts and scholars was tighten that system, have them all also winterized. That has not happened. Things have tightened, right? There have been you know there has been legislation passed saying. Uh, that system also needs to be better, but it's not the same. It's not a requirement. There are certain loopholes that you know generators can get out from. Uh, so things that are obvious have improved, and other things are like you know this is not a requirement, which is what we wanted. Uh, and the question is, you know, then in in that case, have we completely failed, and are we not going to see any improvement, even if the electricity system does better and the gas system doesn't? Are we going to going to be fine? Uh, the the answer to that is is a is a lot more nuanced right and earlier i said how really what was happening at the power plants was was very very important of course fuel supply into that system was also important necessary but but you have to keep in mind there are, there are roughly 500 you know few hundred power generators in texas there are over 10000 natural gas producers some of them producing the range of production by the largest gas producers and by the smallest gas producer, producers in Texas is, a, is an order of three orders of magnitude, okay? Most of them are very, very small. So these are, you know, like, you know, a few few rigs, right? You have your own land and you have gas. This is Texas and that's who you are. And and it's a very different, it, you know, it's, it's one thing to say that that's your vote basis, but that's also your business basis. That's also your people, right? So, so it's it's one that is one. The second thing is, 
the costs are very heterogeneous. To do it for a very large fleet of rigs, large operations, you know, you can have economies of scale and scope there. It's not the same thing to, you know, do things, you know, for, for a smaller operation. So that's just the costs and economics of how if you have a requirement for the gas system to winterize, the costs are, you know, very, very heterogeneous and it it's, you know, gets, gets very tricky. As against, not to say it's easier, I mean, it is certainly easier in the electricity system, right? But, you know, just the structures are, are very different. Um, and I just want to say here that it's really much of the the political calculation, right? Informed by whatever happened in URI, informed by inputs from the oil and gas market participants, electricity market participants, regulators, and analysis is just focusing on the power plant operations, focusing better on, you know, ARCOT planning and coordination with market participants, and, which is what I'm going to talk a little bit next on, is these low-hanging market design, you know, basically uh, aspects, uh, is going to get you most of the way, uh, not mandating the gas system to winterize is still going to leave some problem on the table, but fixing it all the way is going to create more problems. That's the calculation, okay? So, uh, you know, it's, it's not as if, the answer is not as simple as, you know, it's, it, it's, it's the lobby and it's the politics and it's the vote, vote bank, which is all true. It's all part of the equation, but it is a lot more complex. It is it. Because if the answer for the policymakers out of this is, that's fine, you know, yeah, they're important, or fixing that part of the system is important, but we can't do anything and let them be, that just can't be the answer, right? Because if it was that, that important for solving majority of the problem, then that will get fixed. So, you know, this, this is where my current thinking is, right? That m fixing many other parts of the system and tightening the, the gas production system without going all the way can still get you uh, a lot of the way. We'll, we'll have to see how this, you know, gets stress tested. And this, I'm going to skip this for a second. I'll come back to, the, this is about coupling of the electricity and gas system. Uh, th this is basically reinforcing. This is from upstream gas production and loss of power to site was basically cited as, a, as the largest reason why they could not produce as much. Of course, there are other reasons uh, as well. I want to show you this. Um, this is gas production in Texas, right? So roughly 25 BCF uh, per day. Um, and this is what happened during URI, right? So production fell from 25 down to 20, and consumption went up from 12 up to 17 or so. So, you know, you had kind of uh, a movement of, if you will, 10 BCF per day, and yet production was you know, very significant. It didn't shut off, right? Um, and there was still something in there, right? So this is very insightful. This is very, very important to keep in mind a lot of gas still was being produced in Texas. And in fact, more than what Texas was actually uh, using, right? So it has to make you think how big of a problem really was us not producing gas, the gas not being available and being able to move. How big of that, right? And so, you know, this should tell you that, you know, maybe it was not. Not to say that there are other issues, operational issues. Power going off in midstream processing facilities, right? Going off, and so th this was the previous slide, where you have, these are different uh, different uh, compressor systems, right? So gas gas uh, pressure systems, and, and how much of them are electrically operated versus gas. And so even when you're in the gas pumping system, when you're moving the gas, you're, you need, you rely on electricity to move the gas. And you know, if, you, if some of them go, not all of them, but even if you, so this is a very nice paper actually from the from the Electricity Journal a few months ago, where you even for some of these, if you stress them a little bit, they can lead to very massive, like two, three gigawatt shocks in the system, right? Just because you're not able to move gas downstream and downstream gas generators are basically waiting for this gas. And, and these are, you know, tens of megawatts of, of compressors, basically. Yes. No, oh, no. That, that crap. So that, that looked to me like a serial system. And so let's just say one of them, like that little one in the middle that's yellow. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So oftentimes, this is that they simulated an actual system in Florida. Okay. And so oftentimes that can happen. And here you see how a lot of, you know, even in California, a lot of these. <laughs> 
interest rate movement is all electric, elect, using electric electricity for compressor and, and elsewhere as well. And so, you know, one of the one of the insights from this paper is, you know, as we move to electrify everything, what does it do to interdependency? Very, very interesting question. So, uh, okay, I, I still, so my main point here is that gas production per se was not the issue, okay? Moving it was an issue. So yeah, you know, there 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 is, how do you move that? And, and even all of that was not related just to freezing and so on. The coupling of electricity and gas system was also part of even even that answer. So something that happened because of this, and which is kind of a puzzle and a nightmare for, for businesses, is, okay, so you had tight situations, but this is what happened to prices. Normally your prices are dollar, two, three dollars per mm BTU. See what happened, 200, 400, 1200 in Oklahoma. 1200, 600 times more, 600 times more. So part of, you know, the question is, well, was there, was there price gouging? I, I, I thought I had a slide on that. Oh, here, right here on the top, right? Uh, was there pr price gouging? Because now if you are not able to get gas, you're on to the spot market and the spot market folks are like, hey, they're seeing a lot of this was, was you know, undue power exercised in basically moving some of this 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 gas. Because normally, I mean, why is, is, is the system so inelastic, right? Normally, you know, it moves, but really, uh, what happened? So that's that's a question mark. And this is this is an area where the electricity system and the gas system differ, especially in Texas. The electricity system is very open and transparent in Texas, as they are in many other places. Gas system is very much more opaque. Right? You have you don't have much data, and so that kind of part of leads to the difficulty of some of this analysis. So now the final major point. Uh, I also want to be mindful of time. Um, we are we are at time. So the big question is. How do you get money into that scarcity, building more generation during those scarce times? So the, the mechanism used by Texas is, this is the called the operating reserve demand curve. And essentially what happens is when, when the reserves in the system, these are electric reserves, when, when they start dwindling, then more money gets being pumped into the generation system, right? So, you know, you basically, so the, so, Less reserves means your system is moving in scarcity. And so you're like, okay, uh, that should mean more money for people who generate, you know, install capacity to serve that load. So this is the, the kind of at the highest level, that connection. If there is scarcity, that scarcity should reflect in revenues to incentivize future generation. If you give money people, I mean, they're not, that's not going to be helpful now. Now is what it is. But that's kind of the signal, okay. If we run an orange scarcity now, that's reflective of some future necessity for resources during this time. So here is some money, and maybe that incentive. That is the big link. That is how the energy, everything is traded day ahead in real time, but future build is basically also connected to what's happening real time. That's kind of the big construct. It's been it's been very hard to get, get resources. This is when, you know, the next few slides, I'll just take a few seconds. Is this has been growing? This is the wind, you know, nameplate capacity for wind. Uh, this is the average generation, and you see, uh, it's it's very variable. It makes makes, you know, it's very tough when you're thinking about those tight hours for for uh, regulators and system operators to really, you know, put uh, much coinage. I'm gonna skip these two slides, which basically shows that just within a span of one week last year. Uh, and on a day when there was peak demand, wind was doing perfectly fine um, and and helped a lot. But on a day when demand was you know, not that high, the, during the same hours, you know, wind was actually not, this is the span of one week, was not doing as great, and the system had to deploy emergency resources, right? So that, you know, that basically reinforces just this point, is yes, you have the capacity and you have the aggregate generation, how much does it help you in managing those? It, 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 it's a very difficult uh, situation. I'm going to skip this, and I'm going to skip this, and just going to show you this, and that's going to be my, you know, roughly my last point. Lot, lot, lot more price spikes in the system. So this is, you know, what you're seeing. These are the scarcity pricing. So this goes back to the volatility in summer uh, spike here, and that has to do with, you know, as more solar and wind penetrate, 
right? The peak, the peak in Texas basically are moving, have moved. They used to be at 3, 4, 5 p.m. and now they're at, you know, 7, 8 p.m. Uh, you know, something we have seen this already in California, but that's all real. Uh, this is a very nice 2018 paper from colleagues at, at uh, LBNL, from Ryan Weiser and, and, and group, uh, that basically show that, you know, the, it's gone a bit more, even with 20% wind and solar, which is uh, the green one right here, the balanced, you'll see lots, you know, a much more peakier system, uh, which is precisely what is happening in Texas. And those peakier uh, uh, times reflect in larger uh, energy prices. These are called the locational mar marginal prices, which are the, what's happening uh, in the, in the real-time prices. And, and the big difference, the so red dots are from this summer, is they're starting early on, even when there is enough reserve on the system. They're supposed to happen. This, this is more normal. When the reserves are tight, then you see the energy, are, the, the prices are high. But this year, what was happening is, even with plenty of reserve, you're seeing prices were very high. So this is what was happening. Not this, actually. Uh, batteries. So there's a, see, this is the battery condition in Texas. Already three and a half gigawatts, but you just see where this is going. In the next two, three years, it's going to grow by five folds. Uh, okay? And because they are basically, this goes back to your earlier question, they're basically targeting this for those peak hours and they're pricing it that way. They're only offering, they're only, they're unlike wind and solar that offer here, zero dollars. They're always offered, right? Battery is offering only at very large prices. And so this basically reflects in this is even when reserves are very high, anytime you're pulling in generation, so the marginal generation is being targeted towards those, you know, high, high prices. So, you know, this, this is an ongoing issue. And this is my last, last point, which I said earlier, is just earlier this week, Arcot said, I issued a RFP, said, hey, mothballed gas plants, mothballed coal plants, our, our system is going to, so and after this, this weekend, I'm going to spend some time making sure my household is going to be fine, because this is scary. It says, you know, 20% chance will be uh, in emergency uh, in, in Texas in December and through February. And so now they're trying to call uh, mothballed. So these are, you know, plans that have been put away and in some cases actually dismantled is can you offer three gigawatts uh, into the system? Uh, this is very surprising. This is almost like, you know, pr procuring, directly procuring extra capacity now. So and this is, you know, so, so now I can connect it back to my title, which I never spoke about. It's uh, new, <laughs> new wine in old bottle, right? Normally it is, you know, old wine in new bottle. This is new wine in old bottle. What is the old bottle? Old bottle is the the energy only market right this is the, it is it is very nice very beautiful and yet given what's happening in demand given what's happening in solar and wind and how the system is growing uh, what is happening in terms of the politics i can i can assure you and this has been my biggest personal takeaway preparing for this is it's the politicians and regulators are paying this is a very very important issue for them right and so that is why it, and so now they're having to pull out anything and they're not shying away from even going after capacity, right? They're not going to say, hey, this is, we are going to move to a capacity market. But if we need to get capacity to fix this, we're going to go it. You know, it's not about, you know, shaming away or shying away. That's the new wine. It's like, you know, all solutions that are relevant within the larger construct, we'll just, you know, bring it to bear. Yes. Um, so, what I'm trying to think of the work so, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, director. So we're in, so if anybody needs to leave, please feel free to leave. And those who want to stay and cut some hard questions to the day, okay? But go ahead. Not sure. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to make sure people are oh, yeah. Um, so with, so yeah, the procuring, the procuring capacity for short calls, and then you have batteries, which are intending to cover the peaks, but the but they're going to only offer at high prices, right? But they're going to be charging, presumably, on the low price solar and wind, fine, right? But as you, as they put, this could not, not only text kind of more broadly, as you put more and more, you know, with intermittent resources, right? Broadly, solar, and what, maybe you have, you know, geothermal, which 
arguably dispatchable depending on how you set up their plan, right? And does an energy only market or is the ener is an energy only market a proper market structure for a high percentage renewable grid? Otherwise, you have these issues, right? Where you where you're actually then say, oh no, no, we need capacity. So then, wouldn't you want to procure capacity similar like a PJM if you had a really high penetration of renewables on it into the future? Or is there a different market structure that actually preserves reliability within the system, right? And making sure the operation we can use my note. You'll have, you know, give give the phone where you have blackout and. And also maintain, but price, not price certainty, but price consistency, such that you don't have these massive like differences and deltas of LMPs across Texas. And even like you look at Texas and you SPP, it's like Texas is red and then SPP in Oklahoma is like, it's blue and it's cheap and it's nice, right? I've seen those maps before and it's pretty, pretty stark. And furious if there is a different way in which markets need to be structured given you know, the fact that you're going to have these resources because they are more cost competitive. We're switching more to a capacity where you told about what is it? There's someone that must think like electricity is you know, generating electricity is cheap, but moving it is expensive or something like that. But I don't know who said that. Hmm. For, for, for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, that's uh, the, the, the jury is out on that, right? Where is energy only the right construct or, or, or not? But, but this is what is happening the system is basically trying to adjust and make all kinds of adjustments to the ORDC, the Operating Reserve Demand Curve, which is what puts the money to incentivize future generation during those tough times, during you know those scarcity times. And they're experimenting with everything, right? Uh, so earlier, I, I think I showed a chart where uh, they made it flatter. So it went down from 9,000 to 5,000 offer cap. Right? And that was done basically because, you know, for during most of the winter storm from 15th of February through, I think, you know, all the way through 18th or 19th, uh, prices stayed at that level, at the highest level. And that created, you know, massive, massive bills and all led to all those bankruptcies and so on I was, I was showing you earlier. And that became publicly, and some, some customers did receive bills, some, very few, received bills which are thousands of dollars, right? If you were, you know, so so Texas is also a retail, competitive retail market. So you can sign up from any of 100 different suppliers, right? And some of them are like, hey, I'll charge you $10 a month, but, and, and you can benefit from the very low prices that are on the wholesale market. Most of the time that is all true, except when you are in URI, when you're paying $9,000 per megawatt, when normally you pay 20. So those are the customers who receive $15,000 bills. Right, so it, it became politically ugly. So you know that's banned. You can't do that. You can't have you know plants like that in Texas anymore. Uh, but also you know it it nine thousand was like too much. So they brought it down to five thousand. But but they also they fattened. So people were starting to get money these generators earlier on. So they didn't have to wait all the way. So that's one experimentation. Even that was not sending money into the gas system. Right. So they're really right now they're without. SARP, I mean, not even SARP. The governor has already said, we, we need more gas and coal, right? Solar and wind are not helping. Um, and the regulator is like, yeah, we need to, you know, make sure it's it's all going to be dispatchable and operable, right? And so how, and, and from, from Texas's perspective, that's, you know, storage helps. Uh, gas and coal, if they can be, uh, they definitely help. You can call them, right? Because it's it's not about emissions, it's not about, you know, good or bad. It's like, I need, I do not want another URI to happen. And I need to deploy what can. That really, it's, it's at the basic level. It's not animosity to anything. It's like, if you can help that, come to the table. So this is all about, you know, so now what's happening, so this is, this has been cleared by the regulator and now up to the, uh, cleared by ORCOT, up to the regulators now, where they're even experimenting at the very low, so, and I think I might have skipped that over if I go back, right here, right? So this is this is the change that, this is the big change, going from here to here. So this is the fattening, where even at lower results, people are gonna get more money, even though at very low results, they're gonna get less money. Now they're experimenting, this is like hot off the plate, experimenting even, that you can't see on this axis, 
right? Just it's, so it's not zero. You just can't. You know, these are we're talking 10, 20, 30 dollars per megawatt hour. Even in those zones, they're like by the time our reserves are far out, all they're trying to do is because this this goes back, right? Does it? I mean, is, is it like trying to do too much with the energy only market construct and the ORDC construct? What they're trying to do is push more money to generators, right? And certain types of generators with the belief that those are the generators that can do. But but again, they're not saying, hey, gas, you take this money, coal, this. It has to flow through the energy only scarcity. That's the, you know, I would say from a, from an analytical and scholarly perspective, that's a very large experiment that is going on to answer your question. 